So, for those that watch the show on a regular basis, know that um, back was it back in the fall or earlier this year, back when cabbage was coming in. Back uh, earlier this year, you made some sauerkraut that was uh, a little too salty, and that kind of inspired me to. I've always wanted to, just never really took the plunge to get into this fermenting thing, and. Uh, I bought me one of them big five gallon Ohio stoneware crocks and made some sauerkraut. Turned out real good. I've been eating on it. I got where I just like to eat as a side. Yeah. Uh, now, currently, I got these Max Pack pickles growing, and I got pickles. I'm talking about picking seven gallons of pickles every other day. So I had to do something with them. We've been selling a, a good bit of them, but, you know, it can only get rid of so many. So I was going to make me some fermented pickles. And one thing I like about this ferment and stuff, and just, just you know, I ain't, I ain't got into it full flesh, we just tried it out so far. It's a lot easier than your traditional canning and stuff. Really? Yeah. Because I thought, I always assumed it was more challenging because the steps were more. Seen no, I mean, now there's, a, there's some chemistry to it that I ain't, you know, I ain't quite understand all of it too, but if you can get you, find you a good book some good recipes in there. It's a lot easier than having to boil these jars and seal them off and everything. You just ferment it and then put them in the fridge. So this is the uh, this is the book I've been working with here lately. This one here called Fermented Vegetables. And uh, so what I did, let me see if I can find it. I had it bookmarked in there. So we made this recipe here called New York Deli Style Pickles. And uh, I basically, you filled up that five gallon crock with sliced pickles. And suppose you don't use pickling cucumbers and not slicers for this. There's some chemistry reasons behind it. I won't go into all the details. But uh, this particular recipe, we put your pickles in there in the crock. You put some garlic, which I have plenty. Of. My garlic did stratify, by the way. I had pretty good elephant garlic harvest. Some dried red chilies, which I had to buy. I didn't have those bay leaves, pickling spice, uh, and then you make you a brine. Um, now this recipe for the brine, which is basically what you fill it up with. So these aren't, aren't uh, have, they don't have vinegar around them, it's salt water basically. And this said um, three quarter cup of unrefined sea salt to one gallon of water. And I didn't have any unrefined sea salt, I used pickling salt. I will say that the pickling salt seems to be, make it a little saltier, so if you, going to use pickling salt or cannon salt, you might want to dial it back a little bit. Anyway, these things don't take long at all. That You get what you call half sours in three days. In six days or seven days, you've got your full sours ready to go. So we took them out of the crock last night. We put them in jars, put them in the fridge. And uh, Where'd you get this fancy little? I was at the hardware store getting some lids and uh, saw that puppy right there. And I said, that, that So lady. I just seen some, when you pressed on, I seen some water come out of it. Yeah, this one's not, it, it's not a screw on lid. Oh, okay. It's just got a suction on it. So that. with the ferment, are you keeping air tight? Yeah. Like, yeah, so you, just yeah. like when you're making wine. Yeah, yeah, you're just keeping that air tight. Okay. Uh, I might have a little too so you much don't want juice to, in you there. So you don't want to uh, introduce any bad bacteria in there. Right. It's called spoilage. Right. So I brought you a little happy jar here for oh, you to try. Oh, thank and you I, so Well, this much. one you keep, there's your whole one you keep, but I figured you want to eat them on the show. <laughs> so you open it up, you notice you got some grape leaves up top, and that's another thing. Grape leaves? Oh, we're talking about scuffling leaves. Well, same thing. Uh, well, that's a new one on me. So pull them out because you got to leave them on top. I can't just dig around them. You can, you can, but when you're done eating them, you, oh, yeah, you leave them. The purpose of the grape leaves, as far as I understand, is to um, I keep the pickles underneath the brine. Now keep in mind these are fermented, so they got a little tang to them. But uh, I thought they were pretty stinking that's good. Pretty, that's pretty good, Travo. So I've been doing a little research too, and I've kind of got into the ferment a little bit. I hadn't got quite as brave as you are. So what I have uh, learned as far as ferment, let's go back. The only things I've ever fermented that I know of <laughs> were, were sauerkraut, and I made my mistakes there. And of course, we've always fermented a little wine here and there. But the two things that I understand is the most important when you're fermenting is a pair of scales, because you got to get your brine right. Your salt. You need your salt ratio perfect. 
because you can get that. I learned that early on. But even with any of these recipes, you need to make sure that you get that salt right. Mm -hmm. So a pair of scales and also cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Being clean, washing everything out good. You can even use something called Camden tab tablets that the winemakers use that will wash and sanitize your utensils and whatever before you start pickling. So those are the two most important things to go by when you're when you're fermenting. Correct? Yeah, yeah, that seems to be the case. And n not to mention keeping whatever you're fermenting somewhat submerged in the brine and keeping it dark. And that's why that stoneware one I got is, uh, is uh, works pretty good because it, it keeps everything nice and dark. So we bought us a set of that, that uh, crop. We got it, some of it at the local hardware store and we ordered online the weights in the top. And we got What size do you get? I think we got, I don't know, it's a pretty good size. but it's, That one I got, you can't hard tote it. Well, it's probably about that size. It's pretty good. Five. Maybe it's pretty three, good size. Five. Anyway, we got a batch of pickles down at the house in now. Vinegar pickles. We're not fermenting those. We're just doing regular uh, pickling on those. And I tell you, that is a USA made company, and I've been impressed with them. If you uh, are I looking for, worry. if you're looking for a crock or something like that, you need to check them out. I looked at the company three or four years ago and got some prices from them because we thought about carrying the products. However, they do a great job packaging. Look like they've invested in some good equipment to get the packing run there. Because I got thinking it's going to be a nightmare to ship these ceramics. So we opted not to, but I can tell you, I really think highly of the company. USA made, they do a good job, got good quality products, good customer service. They do a good job packing. Our products that we ordered done come in unscathed. So just give a plug out to them. Yeah, yeah, I've been really happy with mine so far. Now, the only thing I might do, I'm, I'm probably going to start me another batch of these pretty soon. But I'm going to do something a little different. So the, these have more of a deal season to them. Because uh, I use that from a pickling mix. I use that dissolvable kind of Mrs. Wages deal pickle mix. Um, that's why the, you see the brine there has kind of got a greenish tint to it. But uh, I'm going to use some more of that. Next time I do it, I'm going to use more of your kind of, and I, I put a little bit of that in the bottom when I repackaged them here. A little bit more of your kind of traditional cloves and your bread and butter pickle seasoning. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go with some of that this next go around. A deal. Yeah. What is piece that piece of garlic? Of garlic? I'm yeah. gonna try that. Now what amazes me is them grape leaves on top. I would have never thought about that. Yeah. So Serves now in, weight. in the in the fermenter, my Ooh. weight. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's different. Uh, in the fermenting crock, my <laughs> weights are like these half moon shapes. I don't know what y'all's look like. I should have prepared myself before I just dug in on that garlic. I was here. wondering what you were thinking. So my weights are like these half moon shaped things. And so it doesn't cover the entire surface of the crock. So you put the grape leaves down, put your, then put your weights on there. It keeps any of the pickles from floating to the top. But anyway, uh, fermenting, I'm, I'm all in on the fermenting. I might try to put some onions in there next time. My wife wants to try some fermented onions. Well, uh, what has happened is everybody that has bought our seed and using our products have an overabundance of squash and cucumbers and things like that. They don't know what to do with them. And fermenting and pickling is a great opportunity to use that surplus produce that you got up. You don't feel so bad for it going to waste out there. Yeah, and, and you ain't got to have, put this, I'll show you that book one more time. Y'all can probably go online anywhere and find that book, but it's a good one there. Uh, you ain't got to have the big stoneware crock. If you just want to do a jar at a time, you can do that. We've got these kits here. Well, let me tell you about that. So one of the things I did read, I've been reading up a lot. I don't study it because that's just the way I am. Studied on it quite a bit. I've been studying on it quite a bit. And one of the common opinions all the experts have out there is do it in quart jars and small batches instead of do it in the big crocks. Now I like the big crock and we use the big crock, but on the ferment part of it, they all recommend using the quart jars and doing it. And the reason behind it is, is we, we we normally don't eat as much as this as we think we do. So that might be making too much making a big batch. Also, if you do make a batch that doesn't turn out well, you can always discard it and you've done a lot. Every batch is a little bit different. So it's always interesting to see how each batch turns out. Um, and they all recommend doing it in smaller batches to get your feet wet to understand it, and then you can kind of move on. I tend to go a little overboard. I do myself. too. I'm an overachiever. Yeah. I like But that does make sense jars. when you can, you know, put it in those 
Those type jars. This there. was the only one the hardware store had like this, but I might go online and buy me a few more of these. I, well, I, I just like what the, name brand? It's a ball. Oh, okay. Uh, I just like the looks of them. That's pretty right there. Yeah. And that's I, that's a year's worth of pickles probably for me and Ty Ty. I told my wife said that's we're gonna keep this one in the fridge. I'm gonna give away the rest of them. Uh, and, uh, in New York City, they tell me that there used to be a lot of pickle shops around up there. Uh -huh. And just about on every neighborhood, a couple or three pickle shops, and people would go there and buy their pickles. There's not as many as there used to be, but I didn't understand that New Yorkers were so crazy about the pickles. And they would actually bring the cucumbers in, and these pickle shops would make the pickles in-house. Mm. So it's like when you catch a mess fish and get somebody to fry them for you. I've been in New York City one time in my life, and that was pretty much enough for me. I got there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I left at 8 o'clock that morning. Yeah? Yep. Quick trip. That huh? was a quick trip. I'm going to set this to the side over here. I'll pick them to the side. But yeah, if you want to try your hand at the fermenting, this kit right here has got everything you need except the wide mouth mason jars. And then uh, you can give it a little try. Try that recipe that we did there. What else we got going on? Uh, corn. Boy, I'm going to have me some sweet corn. Lime will be eating some sweet corn on next week's show. No, I'm a little off. I'm another week off from you on that. You got it silks yet? I got silks, but I'm two weeks out. I know where I'm at. I'm two weeks out to having some good, uh, good food. Now, I'm, I'm out to eat it raw. I'd snacked on it. I ain't got, I, I pulled one of mine the other day, and it ain't close to being dried up yet. I've been laying the water to it. And uh, I got good kernel, good tip feel on mine. Now, the kernels themselves haven't swole up enough to make a nice full ear, but I did take a little nibble just to make sure it was good and sweet. Hickory King's doing good. It's a good tall corn. I got stalks out there probably 12 foot high, and it's silken as well. Now, one thing you want to do when that corn is silken, those tassels, uh, tassels on the corn, and it's putting those ears on, is you don't want that plant to stress at all. And that's where that drip irrigation comes in. At least every other day, I'm putting a little bit of water on those on that corn there. I hadn't had twist any. If you ever have your corn twist, you didn't go way too far. But you want to keep that plant nice and healthy when it's putting that uh, cob on there. Make sure it gets filled out good. That's right. Yeah, I've been watering my corn every day as well. Uh, I've awesome. been having to water my tomatoes about every day too. Yeah, well, every other day, some good goat cheese and a cracker where it'd feel feel That'd be good stuff this. for you. What else we got going on here? Uh, we had a, a guy send us some goodies, and uh, his name was Ken. He's from Kingsland, Georgia, and sent us some pins he made. Now, he said he made these pins. I assume he made the whole thing, made the wood and everything on them. Well, I just ate me a grape leaf. How was that? It was different. Anyway, he's some nice, nice pins. One of them's got my name on them. And, yeah, I got one with my name. And then he sent us one to give away here. And then we answer our questions at the end of the show. We'll pick uh, two of them people to give away one of these nice little pins here. We want to say thank you, Ken. That oh, absolutely. Really, and it's got the little row by row logo on there. Real nice writing pen. I have enjoyed scribing with it so far oh, this yeah. week. Um. Also, we want to tell everybody that we didn't make a hundred thousand by my birthday, which is okay. I knew it was kind of a lofty goal, but we did want to thank everybody out there that that said happy birthday or had any birthday wishes. I didn't, you know, I don't have time a lot of times to go in and reply to each one, but I uh, just wanted to kind of give a nice blanket thank you there. Uh, we got possibly a tropical storm coming through this weekend. Well, I don't even watch the news anymore. Uh, Cristobal. Cristobal. It's down there in Mexico, and um, it could give us. I could lay some corn down. I don't think it's going to get windy enough to lay some corn down, but it could throw some rain. It could make some tomatoes blow up. Yeah. Which uh, we don't need. You right got now. any turn red yet? Pinkish. 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 Fried green tomato type. It's getting close. Good getting deal. Close. Good deal. Last thing before we get into tonight's main subject. Speaking of corn. Uh, my two new varieties of the week here are some heirloom field corn varieties. Uh, we got two of them here. We got this Lancaster Sure Crop, which is supposed to make some big old plants tall ears, about like the Hickory King. And then we got this Reed Gelodent. Now, the Lancaster, can you uh, guess where that originated? Mm -hmm, I've been there. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And then this Reed Gelodent, you got any guesses on that one? I'd say Iowa. Close, Illinois. Illinois. Still around kind of corn country or yep. whatever. Uh, this one is, uh, I think, dates back older than this one does. 
this one dates back to the 1800s but both of these real good uh heirloom field corn varieties make you some fine grits yep or feed your chickens or whatever you want or to do, do with both. Them. all right so this week what i want to talk about was flyers or flowers in the vegetable garden it's getting that time well, we, we kind of, earlier in the spring, we put all our focus on our vegetable production for the most part. And then as we start some succession planting, as we're done kind of in the greenhouse growing out transplants, then we switch our, uh, switch up our mindset to growing some flowers, feeding those pollinators, attracting those beneficial insects, and uh, just kind of making the garden look Yeah, pretty. well, you know, you planted those squash and we look forward to them and squash started coming in, you kind of gorged yourself out on them and you're ready to move on to something else. A lot of people in zone eight and nine have been emailing us, even coming by saying, I got this spot, I've already got my drip tape down there, it's where my squash was at, what can I plant now? I mean, we're in the beginning stages of summer and they don't know what to plant. So here's the, what I tell folks, you can always plant you another succession of okra. Even though you got okra coming along, that okra is going to fade out. So you can plant you another crop there to come along. You can have okra all summer long. Sweet potatoes, still got plenty of time to get sweet potatoes in. And that's a good southern thing there to, to grow. If you're way, way up north, I don't know that I recommend it. But you can still get sweet potatoes in the ground now and do great. Besides those two, then I switch over and I start going towards flowers. Mm -hmm. Now flowers to me, although I did grow some Banaria Giants this spring, flowers to me is normally a summer thing. Yeah. It's a fill-in spot for me, so I, fill, I use it as, as I do a cover crop to fill in those gaps I've got going on. I got five trays of sunflowers right now in the greenhouse. Really? I don't know why, but I just took a hanker and then I planned to be five trays of them. Hmm. I got those giant sunflowers in the ground as part of our little competition we're doing with the other channels. and. Uh, and I, I'm gonna plant me some of them. Uh, we'll talk about in just a minute some chocolate cherry sunflowers pretty soon. Um, we'll get some of those going. Let's talk about real quick before we get into specifics, uh, varieties, and stuff. Why you want to grow flowers in the vegetable garden? Of course, you mentioned it. It's you know it gets that time of year where you can't grow much else. Uh, it obviously is going to benefit your pollinators. Whether you have a hive of bees on your property and you want to feed them. Uh, or you want to attract some more of those native bees. Mm -hmm. And I got a couple of varieties I'm going to show you in a little bit that uh, those native bees absolutely love. Uh, also beneficial insects, your butterflies, stuff like that are going to love them. You're going to see a lot bigger, higher populations of beneficials in your garden, which is going to help out your pest control regime. Uh, not all overall. bugs are bad. Not all bugs are bad, surely not. Uh, it just looks good, you know. To have them in the garden and, and it help you out if you're getting a tight one. Well, also your mental state sometimes. Sometimes you're kind of down and out and you want to walk out there and just things brighten up your day and you just feel better after you walk through the garden and you come back. Not to mention getting in a tight. That's a different scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Now we all out to make, let me back up here just a minute. Let me see politically, politically correct say this. You're all out to make mistakes sometimes with the wife or the girlfriend or whoever. And say something you may not have meant to say that struck her wrong. I went some places. Or didn't come in in time yeah. or whatever. Stayed out fishing yeah. with some buddies You know when long. you come in and she got that look and old lips poked out there rolled around you and you know you're in trouble. Simply just take off your shoes and dig out there to the garden with your knife and cut you a nice bouquet is what we have right here. Yeah. That right there could be the difference between sleeping in your bed and sleeping on the couch. And there's no way you're going to bring that back in there and that lip still poked out because it's going to gradually draw back in and she's going to have a different attitude. It's just the same thing as buying her a new pair of tennis shoes. She's got a whole different attitude after you bring that back in there. That's right. That's right. It works, works just like a charm every time. There's a little, little spider on that Now, one what there. we got right here is a few different varieties in there. I got a zinnia stuck in there just for good measure there. But these different varieties that we got in there, these, I believe, these all come out of my garden and Miss Hoss's garden. I know that one right there mm -hmm. come out of mine. Different shades of them. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go over them in just a minute. Let's, leave, ahead the, of myself, let's leave them right there because we're we going to we'll talk about several kind of categories of, of flowers or cut flowers. I got some little tray of seeds right here. And uh, first, we want to talk about sunflowers. Uh, 
Now we've got quite a few different sunflower varieties. One of our kind of specialties and one of the things we kind of pride ourselves on is having a real good selection of these things called Pro Cut sunflowers. And uh, these are single stem sunflowers. So they produce one time, produce one head, kind of a smaller head, but uh, the stalks are real nice and strong and these are perfect. The Pro Cut variety is designed to do this number right here. You know, put them in a vase, put them inside. Now, if you go to your home depots or your big box stores and they got little packs there of sunflowers, I can promise you it's not the Pro Cuts. The Pro Cuts cost a lot more money than what those regular old seed sunflowers do, but they have a lot of different attributes to them that those don't have. If you just want to plant them out there and let the birds come eat the seed up of them, those cheap ones that work as good as anything. But if you want something to help you out, if you get in a certain situation where you do need to go out there and cut them, or if you have intentions to cut them anyway, you want to go with the Pro Cut series. And the good thing about the Pro Cut series is that they are pollenless. Uh, what so, does that mean, Trail? So it means you can shake them all up and down and they're not going to get all them yellow specks on your table. It'll keep yeah. the wife happy. You can put them wherever you want to. And a lot of people have said, since they're pollenless, that, does that mean the bees don't really like them, don't care for them? I'll tell you, you grow these things, the bees will be all, all over them, uh, even though they are pollenless. You just don't have to clean up after yourself when, once you bring these in there. That's right. That's right. So we got several different colors of the Pro Cuts. I'll try to go through them here. So we got a few examples. This one here is called the Red Lemon Bicolor. Real nice, pretty. So it's got the red on the inside, the yellow on the outside. So the red lemon bicolor. And then I don't think you have one of these here. We got this one here called the White Knight, which is a white one. Uh, I grew that one last year. Really, really good. We got this Pro Cut Red. I'm not sure you got that one here either. That's not one of them. No. Uh, which makes a dark red petal. We've got this Pro Cut Lemon, which you do got one of those. Right here. Uh, no, I think up top here. Yeah, is that a that's bicolor? the most one of the most popular ones right there. Is that lemon? Um, we got the lemon. We got one called plum, which I'm not sure you got. And then we've got the orange, which you definitely got there. Where right here? Yeah, that's um, it right there, right? Yeah, yeah. Lots of different colors on those. Uh, if you dig back in the video archives, I actually did a video last year where I mixed up. Uh, a pack or two of each made me a blend. You can plant these things with our cedar or you can transplant them. Uh, but you can plant them all together, make a mix of, if you just like one or two of the colors, you like them all, you can make you a little mix. And uh, they'll, they'll kind of come, they won't all come off right at the same time, just at different times and you got a nice little array there. You can plant them thick too. Yeah. So those are the Pro Cut series there. And, and the other ones we got here on the site, like he mentioned, the Pro Cut is a real high grade sunflower. Uh, if you want to just go out there and just throw some by hand, you know, kind of be a little more, uh, I don't say careless with it, but just, you, you don't want to, you know, plant them in a specific row or whatever. You just want to kind of throw some and rake them in. These are the ones you should go with. So this one here, we just added this year called the Chocolate Cherry Sunflower. Have you seen that one? No, but it sounds good. Uh, well, I don't think you can eat them. No, I would want to, chocolate yeah. cherry. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to grow me. I know Jason at Cog Hills got a bunch of these growing. I'm going to plant some of these uh, pretty soon. We also got this one called Autumn Beauty, which is really popular when we have a hard time keeping this one in stock. We got the old Teddy Bear, which is real popular. Real nice fuzzy head on it. And then we've got the Santa Fe Sunset, which is a um, nice kind of light colored bloom there with some yellow and some orange on it. So some of those seeds that you just mentioned are more economical. If you wanted to plant a real, a whole bunch of them. Um, I think all these, uh, the non-pro cut ones, I think we carry those in quarter pounds. Uh, the pro cuts we carry them in the packets of 50 seeds and a thousand seeds. So we got the sunflowers there. I didn't mention the, the giant hybrid ones that, that we're growing as part of the competition, but uh, those are nice as well. Lots of all, good options. You know, you can actually use these as a cover crop. Right. And get the benefits of drawing the insects in there for the pollinators. And also, you know, they grow up, they shade out the other weeds, so they can very well be used as a cover crop. And then decide to you know, get flowers off of them. 
Yep, and you can mow them down, chop them down once they're done, and then you can um, you can turn around and plant a different <coughs> cover crop or yep. plant something else. I'm gonna do a little twirl here like the modeling girls do, and then I'm gonna be through. You have to make that noise, wow. don't you? Yeah. Twirl. All right. That was a twirl. Now the second thing we're going to talk about so we got a lot of sunflowers we do good with sunflowers on our site got a lot of options there at zinnias we got a lot of options for Ooh, zinnias, zinnias. To do. <coughs> let's talk about you gonna get your zinnias you gotta get up all right get up and stretch out don't knock, knock now i'm gonna tell you i had a spot out there in my garden that i really didn't have plans for and early on i transplanted me a big area of benary giant giant zinnias and i probably grew the prettiest crop i've ever had these things are absolutely gorgeous. Now you grew, you, you must have grew some of the limes and whites individually as opposed to the mix. Those might have come, no, the whites, I got some whites in my mix. I don't know they got any limes. Miss Hoss might have thrown a lime or two in there. <coughs> she I might have planted some of that no, those key, whites, lime, those, key lime mix. That white is in the uh, is in my mix. There ain't a lot of them, but they in there. Yeah, but these other ones. No, these think. limes are not. I think she might have grew that down at her house. She might have thrown, she's trying to throw us off right there. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. With the, so we got this lime here. You want to go ahead and cover it first? Well, we got we got several different options. Let's talk real quick about the difference between the binary zinnias and the uh, the other kinds, because because some people uh, might wonder about that. So the binary, that name is kind of just the name. It's like Nike when it comes to tennis shoes. You know, binary is is the name for zinnia cut flowers. Uh, if it's got that name on it, that means. It's the biggest blooming zinnia out there, pretty much is what it means. I mean, that's a big old zinnia bloom. There's lots of different zinnia varieties out there, but these binary ones are bred to make real big blooms and they make really good cut And it's flowers. got a good plant structure that is able to, to hold up that big bloom. They just, they lend themselves well to a cut flower. We got lots of different colors, which you can all see here. You've got the, the orange, you got uh, the scarlet, which is this one right here. You got the wine, which is this color right here. Uh, you got the coral. Um, is that coral? Uh, no, that's not coral. Is that coral? I don't think we've got a coral in there. That's it. I think that's, that's it. it. Right? That's it right there. Let's see if I can fish her out of there. There you go. <coughs> so we got all those individually. Uh, and then I don't think we have the yellow one individually, but we've got most of these individually and then we have the mix. You can get all the colors. Now the mix has the white in there, but just a f not a ton of them, but it does have a few of the whites in there. Got one with a brute neck. Uh oh. And, but the mix doesn't have the lime as you're showing here. Now my wife really likes the lime one. Here's the lime. And, um. So we've got that lime there. If you like the lime, get that individually there. Now you could take the lime and get a packet of the mix and mix them together and basically have what you got going on here. Uh, if you're starting out, I would recommend going with the mix. I can't, you can't go wrong there. And then you kind of move on from there. I planted the up. mix early on and then, then I'll go back and I'll plant some solid colors to complement one another. I don't always plant one solid color, at least plant two. So I can get some contrast going on there. Right. Now, just like with the pro-cut sunflowers versus some of the regular sunflowers, we've got the binary zinnias, and then we've got kind of more standard zinnias. Uh, they're a little more affordable, especially if you want to buy a lot of them. And I'll go through some of these. And some of these I really, really like because it's, it's kind of my two favorite zinnia colors. Now, we've got this one here called the zinnia cactus mix. Uh, and the leaves on it look a little different. They're a little more curled on the sides. Uh, but if you want to grow a bunch of zinnia seed and you just kind of want to stroll them out, rake them in, this is the way to go. Two ones that we just added uh, a month or so ago, and this is the one I like here, this key lime pie. So if you like me and you like the white and you like the lime. Or you like key lime pie. Right. This is the way to go. You get these right here and you, you plant them and you got a nice little mix of the lime and the white ones there. And then the last one, this is a new color uh, in itself called Ice Queen Zinnia. Whoever was naming these zinnias was hungry. They was hungry, making me hungry, making me want to uh, go get a, a Ice cream with, cone. A, with a, a, on some key lime pie. <laughs> <laughs> so those are our zinnias. So slide them out of the way. Mm. I'll skin up our studio here. 
All right, and then the last thing, I wanna talk about a few of these other varieties here that, that may not be as well known as the zinnia and sunflowers, but things y'all should be growing. And this first one here, is uh, you probably have time with that that name right there a little bit. Mm, I don't know where but uh, I grew this one last year the first time. Uh, our friend Lisa had recommended it to me. It's called Ageratum. And it makes some small little blue flowers, you know, about the size of a quarter, but it loads up with flowers. It's really, really, really heat tolerant. And I grew lots of different new flower varieties last year. And the little tiny native bees, you know what I'm talking about? Not the ones in your beehive, the little tiny native bees absolutely love this ageratum here. And if you are doing a, a bouquet or something. Always like, good to have some of those. It's a good filler plant. You can fill in those voids in there. Now, I don't really like to admit this, but I will every now and then get up there by myself and make a, a bouquet. Yeah. By myself. Just kind of, you get feeling artistic. I get not feeling artistic. I get under the shade tree. Old dog sits down there. Tank sits down there beside me. And we go to filling in the gaps and moving the colors. Tank give you a few pointers. Yeah. On where yeah. To, where to and we'll get it just right. Now, I don't do it a lot of times. And I don't like nobody watching me while I do it. Give me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. But yeah. I, if I'm by myself, just take it. Neighbor be peeking over yeah, the fence. Yeah, I don't like that. But if I'm by myself, I'll get one and I'll get it just perfect before I carry it down to the house. So, native bees... Uh, this ageratum. Now, the seeds on this ageratum and some of these others I'm going to show you here in a minute are pretty small, okay? So you need to be growing these in your trays. Your more than 62 trays work perfect, but they're small. You got to take your time, put your one seed down there. You don't want to go throw these in the garden because no. you ain't going to go very far because the seeds are so small. So you got to grow these from transplants. The next two here are what we call our celosia. And we got two different kinds. We got the uh, chief mix, the one people, some people call coxcomb. Now these have been around for Looks ever. like a rooster comb. If you lived in the south and your grandma lived way out in the country, I can promise you she had some of these in her flower bed. These are pretty. These are pretty. Uh, nice big old blooms. You'll see the bees working these. Now the, the century mix here is more kind of the flame shaped bloom, mm -hmm. whereas these, the chief is more kind of the rooster comb shaped mm -hmm. bloom. Now these things love heat and they can tolerate a little dry weather. They can, they can. Uh, these seeds are kind of small too, so you want to start these in your trays and you plant them out and um, and they are one of the flowers that can, even the zinnias, when it gets into August and it strikes off real dry, they'll come back in the fall, but you'll see them suffer a little bit. These things right here just keep ticking yep. along. Yep, that's a, that's a tropical plant. And then we've got our cosmos here, which the real extreme heat seems to zap these things. They, they like the earlier, you know, Late early to late spring to early summer weather. We've got two different mixes, and I grew this uh, Versailles mix last year. And uh, I, I tell you what, the butterflies really, really like this stuff. I uh, really had good luck with the cosmos. Yeah, all your butterfly mixes have cosmos on them. Lots of good options there. The last thing I want to mention, and I'm not going to go into this in too big of a detail because we could do a whole show on these things here. We got these wildflower mixes we just we brought on this year, and we've had a We've been selling heaps of these things. And we sell them in um, quarter pounds, half pounds, and pounds, I think, maybe. That's yep. a quarter pound there. So this southeast wildflower mix right here. We got regional. Has got several different ones in it. It's got a good many annuals and a good many perennials. So I took me a spot next to the house down there. Oh, I believe it was Tuesday was a week ago. And I had pine straw on it, and I just raked the pine straw back. And you need six to eight hours of daylight per day to make these mixes work well. So I got a little bit of shade down there with pine trees, but I got a good, little, good bit of sunlight too, enough I think it will work. So I raked me about a thousand square foot off, and I planted me some southeastern wildflower mix, and I raked it in. And by Saturday, it was coming up. Yeah. They come up fast. So we got we got four regional mixes. We got southeast, northeast, midwest, and western. Now if you go on our website and look at these, under each one I list the states. Uh, you know, if you're confused if you should be western or midwest or whatever, you can see which states they are. With these wildflower mixes, it's not like strowing a cover crop. You don't you really don't have to cover them 
hardly any. Uh, some places say don't even rake them in at all. A lot of these lights, or excuse me, a lot of these seeds require light to germinate. They do recommend tamping them down a little bit. So you can take a shovel or you just get out there and romp around with the youngins to pack them in. But just a cultivated area, throw the seeds out there, maybe tamp them in with your feet, give them a little water. What I did was a light raking in, and some of that light raking in may have covered some of them, but it by no means covered all the seeds. But not like with the big landscape Oh, rake, no, 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 I'm talking with a hand rake. Like right. a leaf rake is what right. I'm talking about. Yeah. So we got those four regional mixes, then we got these two here. We got one called the Beneficial Insect Mix. And the Bee Attractor Mix. And Excuse all, me, the bee attractor wildflower mix. And all these mixes have about 20 different things. In, like this one, for instance, this beneficial insect mix has cilantro in it and mm. dill. Mm. Uh, so all these have about 20 different seed types in them. And you can go online and, and, and see what's in each one there. Uh, but these things have been real popular this year. We're excited to bring them on. Now this is not to be confused with a cover crop or used like a cover crop where you're going to plant something, you're going to till it in, and you're going to come behind it and plant something else. These you want to use in the area that you're going to leave alone and let these mature out. And reseed. The, the reseed because there's a lot of perennials in there. So this is something that you leave alone and it comes back from year to year and you get to enjoy all those beautiful flowers, whether it be an annual or a perennial. Those annuals in there will seed out. Yeah, so you want these to two reseeds. You want to put them in an area, got a little plot beside your garden you can cultivate and just designate as your wildflower or your beneficial uh, flower plot that you're going to bring in those, those good insects with. Yep. All right, let's put them up there. Lots of good stuff there and if y'all have any more questions about flowers or uh, maybe you got some good input on some other kind of flowers that you like to grow, definitely let us know about those in the comments below. So we got some questions to answer, but what I want to know is how are we going to give away the neat little pen that we got with all these questions? I don't know. You got any good ideas? I don't have any good ideas. I was just going to pick my fa the favorite question I answered, and but I'll, you can do how you can pick however you want to. I got a pen to give away. You got a pen to give away. I ain't got a pen to give. We just got one pen to give away. Well, you got one. Well, it's got my name on it. I thought you had another one. No, we just got one to give away. Oh, we just got one. Okay. We yeah. just got this one here. Yeah. Well, uh, we can any, mini, money, mo, yeah. or whatever. I say uh, let's do the easiest one to pronounce. How about Larry Bowman? Well, we got to get through the questions. I know, first. but we're just going to we'll go ahead and give it away now. Okay. Okay. So we're going to send this to uh, Larry. Larry T. Bowman. Okay. So if we do answer your question on the show, send us an uh, email to cussserve at hostels.com. We'll send you a nice little prize. And, uh, and, and Larry was the big winner today. And Larry's box will throw yeah. in this nice little pen here. So the first question is from Seeds and Sanity to Travis, and they say, I have a small garden. Could I mix two cocktails, and I'm assuming they're talking about pesticides, mm -hmm. in two separate sprayers and only use what I need and save the rest in the sprayers for the next time I need it, or do I have to discard it and mix fresh every week? So we had a few people ask several different variations of this question uh, based on last week's show where we talked about pest control stuff. And so the, the general idea of the question is here is do you have to use what, you all, what all you mix up or can you save it? And the easy answer is only mix what you're going to use right there. Don't try to save the stuff. Um, why is that? Well, sometimes depending on what the pH of your water mm -hmm. is, uh, it can buffer those chemicals and change it. It's just like even if you're using a herbicide or anything, anything you're mixing up to spray there, uh, your water pH can affect it over time. Uh, so you want to just mix up what you're going to use. Don't save it. Um, that's the best advice I can For most it. time, you'll lose half life of that chemical overnight. Yeah. So my pH here, out of the well, my pH here is about a 7.8, which is pretty high. But when you mix a pesticide it in with that. explains all them gray hairs. explains sure. them gray hair. If you mix a pesticide in there, you'll lose at least half life on some of these overnight. And then some of them can last two or three days. But you go two, three, or you go a week, you probably lost all the goody yeah. out of your I don't pesticide. even wait 10 minutes to go get me a cold drink. As soon as I mix it up, I'm putting it out. Oh, All yeah. of it. Yeah, and, Every and bit don't of mix it. up no more than what you need. If you got a little leftover, go down there and spray the shrubbery around the house or spray your neighbor's shrubbery or spray your car, your dog, or something. Get rid of it. Now, what happens sometimes, and especially if those people went to school at Tuscaloosa or in Auburn, 
they can't they don't need to mix up that much and they can't figure out how to half it and stuff. So then people, they should call somebody over here. Call an expert. Call an expert in Georgia or some one of your surrounding states and they could help you half that recipe so you don't mix up too much. Right. And the last thing you want to do is go out and pour it down the storm drain. Yeah. You don't want to do that because you don't want to contaminate any uh, runoff. So spray it out wherever you might be and then when you get ready for it again, go at it again, mix you up a fresh batch. That's right. Number two is from Melu Melu B, and it said, "Oh my goodness, Greg, did I hear you say wasp with a T? Wasp, what what you said? Wasp, yeah, at the end." She said, "Not making fun, I never do that, but that's exactly how my husband pronounces it with all the locals." I don't, I don't read the rest of it, but uh, that I I was grown for I knew how to spell the word wasp. And then wasp, it's wasp. Vost. Vost. They kind of look around, flying around, look like they're toting a suitcase, and hickey him, hitch him, and you get dizzy. That's Vost. They will leave a hickey on you, too. W A U S T, Vost. Vost. And all of us here in the South are cousins. So we all related some way or form or fashion. Yeah. And we all talk pretty much like, we don't realize how bad we talk till we listen to ourselves. And that, then we realize how bad it is. That or somebody asks a question, don't understand a word that you think everybody yeah. should already know. All right, and old Larry T. Bowman, which is the winner of the fancy pen, says, at what plant growth do you start your pest control spraying? Do you start right after planting? I got some squash coming up. Oh, they, they've come up. they just starting to put on them long, that first set of true leaves coming out there. And uh, even though them plants look small, that's when I want to start spraying, especially this time of year when I know them squash bugs can start getting bad on me. So uh, <coughs> if you're transplanting, my general rule is to wait about a week after you put that transplant in the ground, let it get some roots on it, uh, or, or start. You can tell when a transplant starts, you know, has overcame the transplant shock. So if you're transplanting, once those things start going, uh, if you direct seeding, once I got true leaves, uh, I'm, I'm treating them. Number four is from uh, Anna Thibodeau. And uh, so do either of you add Epsom salt to your pepper plants? No. No. And to you the reason why, most of them they don't need it. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate and very rarely do you see magnesium deficiency in a pepper plant if you're using a good fertilization program. Use that micro boost and you're going to get some of it in there, but it takes very little of magnesium for pepper plants. So I hardly ever use it, but when I do, it's more on a leafy vegetable such as collards, turnips, mustard. You will help with the greenness of those plants a lot, but I can't ever remember using it on uh, peppers or tomatoes. I know a lot of people that, that, that swear by it. and uh, By a foliar application, I'm assuming. Now, I definitely wouldn't do a root application of it, but if you did a foliar application, I see how you could get some cosmetic benefits it, it, out of it. It will make the green. It will make the green because nice that's what magnesium sulfate does. I don't know that it would add to how healthy the plant is. I, I I like the uh, nothing wrong with using Epsom salt. Plenty of people do have for for a while, but I like the micro boost formulation a little better. Yeah. Now, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get confused and use magnesium Epsom salt thinking it's going to help you with blossom end rot because it's going to do just the opposite. If you do it as a soil drink, so those magnesium ions are going to force out the calciums and not let that calcium get up there to help with that blossom end rot. And that's what compete. you want. Yeah, you don't want to use that. So the use of magnesium sulfate needs to be sparingly and only you really use it if you need it. That's right. All right, and Robert Jones wants to know, what is a fish cooker? Now, this question was funny to me. I, I, I took a picture of this and sent it to my buddy Jason. Uh, sometimes we get talking about, and I don't remember what we was talking about fish cookers for, but we get to using common... Oh, oh I know what we was talking about. We was talking about canning. Canning out in the yard, I believe. Oh, I didn't know if we was talking about that or doing low country boil. Oh, it was low country boil. It was low country. That's right, it was. We could have been talking about it either way. Right. And so, when in the South, when you hear the term fish cooker, it, it just in general means a big stainless pot. It could be this size or it could be huge that you set on top of some type of propane gas heat, instrument gas instrument now, there's lots of variations of them out there you have many different types of fish cookers but when we say fish cooker it's not always talking about cooking fish 
Just yep. a big pot over a propane flame. Classifies as a fish cooker. It can be used to can vegetables. It could be used for low country boil. It could be used for a lot of different things. Cooking Boiling fish. peanuts. Boiling peanuts, cooking fish, uh, uh, de-feathering chickens. Heck yeah. Uh, We've done that before. Yep. Lots of, uh, we couldn't have forward them fancy pluckers. No, we had to dip them and scald them. Scald them and pluck them, pluck them is what we did. Anyway, fish cooker, like, you probably seen a fish cooker, used a fish cooker and didn't know it. You, you proud of them? I marriage. am proud of them. So folks, let me tell you something. You need to be thinking seriously about these flowers. And if you're interested, we got some real good videos out there on flowers. I know we got some on sunflowers. Yep. We got some on zinnias, and I believe we got a video or two showing you how to cut those zinnias. A little trick for you there. That's right. Several good videos over there, and I'll put some of those right here on this side of the screen so you can go check those out. Some direct seeding and some transplanting applications. We really hope you guys enjoyed tonight's show, and we'll see you next time. Take care.